Well, hey everyone, welcome to Church Online. My name is Ty, I'm the executive pastor here at New Song Church. And I'm excited here today because we are actually going to start a mini two-part series, a sermon series. We are still going through the book of Matthew, but right now we're going to go two-parter in the Lord's Prayer. So we're in Matthew 6, 5 through 8. And we're breaking this up in two parts because one, Jesus actually teaches this in two parts. So today, the, the sermon title for today is Preparation, because he, he's going to teach us what to do, what not to do, how to get our hearts and our minds ready before we even utter a word in prayer. So we're going to learn the pattern next week, the pattern of prayer next week. But today, it's preparation. And what a great gift it is to be able to actually learn prayer from the one who had the greatest prayer life in history, and that's Jesus. And he understands how important prayer is to our walk and, and, and to our life as, as followers of Jesus. It's the, the method that God uses to meet our needs. It's, it's the method that we can use to, for healing. And, 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 and what we do is, is when we pray, we, we actually uh, gives us encouragement and, and confidence to face the daily challenges that we all face, especially now in this time. Uh, you've heard me say this a few times, but prayer is our most profitable activity. It's the one thing as Christians that we can do for someone that, that is more profitable than anything else. Uh, prayer is more profitable for the people that are elected, our elected officials for us. That if we pray for them, we're actually doing more for them in prayer than we could anything else. For our loved ones, for those that we care about. It's the most profitable thing that we can do as Christians is a prayer life. I love what Raven, Leonard Ravenhill says. He says that a man is no greater than his prayer life. That we can't achieve more in our life than, than, than the ceiling of our prayer life. So we're going to dive into this in the next two weeks. And, and we're going to learn from Jesus exactly how we can have an effective prayer life. But first, this week, we're going to learn about getting our hearts and our minds ready. So if you've got your Bible, turn to Matthew 6. We're at 5 through 8. And this is what Jesus says. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. I love how Jesus starts this teaching, when you pray. He has taken, taken the, the given that, that His disciples, the, the people that follow Him, are praying. And He doesn't say, if you pray. He doesn't say when you feel like praying or or when you have the time to pray. He's saying when you pray. Because as Christians, we have a prayer life. So so if you know me, you know that I like to fish. So if we're we're starting to get to know each other a little bit and you ask me a little bit about what, what I like, and I'll tell you, well, I like to fish. And if you would ask me a question, well, how often do you fish? And if I replied to you never, then you would understand that there's a little inconsistency going on. Well, you said that you were a fisherman, but you don't fish. That doesn't make sense. And that's the same in our Christian walk. If, if you would say that, Ty, are you a Christian? And, and I would say, yes. Then how often do you pray? And I say, never. That I don't ever talk to Jesus. I never talk to God and God doesn't speak to me. Then, then there's an inconsistency there. It's not if you pray, it's when you pray. And he goes on to say, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Last week, Taylor did an excellent job of of really sharing the dangers of hypocrisy to putting on a show so other people can see. And so there's not a whole lot that I can add there, but we are going to still talk about it because Jesus talked about it and then he's talking about it again. So it's an important subject. See, he's He's starting, and I love how he's starting this, because he's teaching us first when it comes to prayer. You, you would think that a lot of times when we're trying to teach someone about something, it's, okay, you do this first, and then you do this, and then you do this. But Jesus starts with, don't do this. Don't be like the hypocrites. 
Don't pray to be seen by others. Now, now back in the day, so a lot of religious leaders, they would go to these prayer meetings and they would go into this area so they can pray and, and, and show people how holy they are how spiritual they are. And so they went on and it was a, it was a public performance really. And, and so Jesus kind of saw through that and, and he understood what they were doing. And he's like, there's no room for that. See, when you, when you pray, when your only time you pray is when there is an audience around. If, you're, if your only time you pray is, is during a prayer meeting or, or when there's other people around, then that kind of proves that, that your audience really isn't God. So he's saying, don't do that. Don't, don't do it for show. What he's saying is, is, is that he's, he's not condemning a prayer meeting. There's absolutely a, a place for prayer meeting. There's a place to gather with brothers and sisters and pray. But he's saying that it's, it's really your intent of your heart is what matters. It's like, are you praying so, so you can get the applause of men and the, the respect of others? Or are you doing it just to be praying to God? What he's saying really is that, remember, this is prayer. It's not a performance. That we are praying, we're not performing. But again, he doesn't condemn the public prayer meeting. As a matter of fact, in, in, in Matthew 14, he actually shares about his own public prayer meeting in, in, in Matthew fourteen nineteen, he says, then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. He's not against the prayer meeting, but he's saying that what's inside, what, what our motivation is, is the general concern. And that's why he said, don't be like the hypocrites. It's not a performance. It's not a show. It's, it's an intimate thing between you and God. It's, it's a really, it's the, the power of prayer is really the power of secret prayer. It's between you and God. See, there's, there's, there's really two kind of prayers. There's a performance prayer or there's a relationship prayer. So what's the difference between performance prayer and relationship prayer? Well, with anything that we do, if it's prayer or, or any kind of action that we do, there's, there's really three things. There's the action that what we do. There's the motive behind the action, and then there's the result. So what is performance prayer? Performance prayer, the action really is, is not prayer at all. It's, it's more of a public speech. It's a performance in front of other people. And then what the motive is behind that is, is it's done for man's praise. It's, it's done to, to get the, the accolades and, and to make people impressed with, with how spiritual you are. That's the motive behind it. What's the result? Well, the result is that your reward is paid in full. You're going to get the respect and the, the honor from other people. You're going to receive human praise. But that's not the prayer that Jesus is teaching on. He's teaching against that. What he wants is the relationship prayer. And what's the action behind that? Well, it's not public at all. It's very private. The prayer of a relationship prayer is really just a prayer for an exclusive person, an exclusive audience, and that is the person of God. The motive is, is the reason why we're praying isn't, isn't to impress anybody, but it's to honor and obey God. But then what's the result of that? No praise at all from anybody. You have no praise at all from men, but you have a reward from heaven. See, the truth is, if, if we're seeking human approval in anything we do, if it's prayer, if it's church activity, if it's work-related stuff, if it's personal stuff, if we're seeking human approval, we can find it. We will find it. But if we're seeking God, then you can also find Him. But the truth is, is when you're seeking God, a lot of times the human approval just isn't there. So the question is, what are you seeking? If you're seeking human approval, you will find it. But if you're seeking God, you will find him too. First Chronicles 28, 9 says, And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. The Lord understands every plan and every thought. 
God rewards a sincere prayer. He rewards the secret prayers. He, he, he doesn't have any rewards for the prayers of a showman. That it's not performance. It's prayer. Don't be like the hypocrites. That's what Jesus is teaching. And then he goes on to say, but when you pray. So now he's going to talk about what we should do before we utter a word. What are we going to get our heart right with? But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So he's saying, go into your room, shut the door. So the question is that we have to ask ourselves is this, are we willing to do something for God or are we willing to do something with God that nobody else is going to see? So what does that mean? What's that like? It's, and Taylor ta- talked about this last week. We, most of our lives are very visible. If we go to church, people know that we're at church. When we give, people can see us giving. When we serve, people can see us serving. And, you know, when we turn the other cheek, people can even see that. People see what we're doing. But no one knows about your secret prayer life. That is between you and, unless you tell somebody about it, but then it's not so secret. But nobody knows your secret prayer life. That's between you and God. And what Jesus is, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do something with and for God that nobody else sees? And while it's true that, that we can pray anywhere, we can pray anytime, there's something about having a place where Jesus says, go into your room, close the door. There's something about having a place. I think every Christian should have a place where they go that is a meeting place between them and God. I like to pray when I'm driving. I like to pray when I'm going for walks, when I'm at the beach, when I'm in the back porch, the backyard, when I'm working, I, there's a lot of opportunity for prayer and they're all good. But I also have a space where I go, a space that is designed for, for, for me to go and just be with God and there's nothing like it. There's a space that I go that, that there won't be any distraction, there's nothing there to distract me, that, that when I'm in there, the door is closed and I can pray to God with an earnest heart, with an open heart, with an emotion that I can't do around other people. He's saying, go into that room and close the door. Shut out the distractions. Are you willing to go into a room and shut the door? Are you willing to take some time with God and turn off your cell phone for just a minute? Are you willing to turn off the television set? Are you willing to to leave a text message, go unanswered, to stop checking your social media and see how many followers or how many likes you have on whatever else? Can, Can you turn off all the noise and all the distractions of life and job and busyness and kids and everything else that you have? Are you willing to turn it all off? Are you willing to push it aside and simply go into a room, shut the door and be with God? Because the truth is this, that God is not interested. God is not interested in competing with the other voices in your life. He will not compete with all the noise that you have allowed to put into your life. Because I know those things will speak louder if we let them. Go into your room, shut the door. Are you willing to turn off the distractions and simply be with God in heaven? And if you are, my suggestion would be to schedule it. And I know that seems odd saying, well, you're going to put God in the calendar. Yes, I'm going to put God in the calendar. Now I pray without ceasing and we want to do all those things and we want to to be with God throughout the day. Absolutely. But the thing is, is that the things that are important to you are generally scheduled. Work is scheduled. You can't just show up to work when you feel like it or or whatever because you have a certain time you start. And because it's important to you, it's on your calendar and you go at that time. You push everything else aside and go. School for your kids is scheduled. Birthday parties are scheduled. Events are scheduled. Why can't we schedule God? Because here's the truth that I have found out as, as I continue to grow in my relationship with the Lord is this, is that unless you make time for God, you're not going to have time for God. 
And it's a very intentional thing because what will happen is the to-do list will grow and, and the distractions will come and the voices will come and you will have so much. You'll be doing this and this and this and God, I'll get to you in just a second. And we just go until we go until we go until we run out of day and we haven't even checked in yet. So unless you make time for God, you're not going to have time for God. And then we get worn out. And we feel defeated. And we feel disheartened. And we feel like we're on this roller coaster that's just going up and down and pulling out here and pulling there. And, and, and how, I don't have time to, to go and close the door and be with God. What, who has time for that? I got all these things going on and we just run and we're running on empty. That's why it's important to turn off everything, to, to go into the room, shut the door and let the distractions go. I shared this story before, but it fits this this sermon here, when there is a time we were going on vacation to the Oregon coast. And on the way back from the Oregon coast, Brandy was, this was the maddest she's ever been at me. This is the maddest. And, and the, the, the funny thing about doing, telling this story here now is because I've shared this story before from the stage and she's, she's in the seat and she's, there's buffer, right? There's, there's time that will go away and, and she'll be fine. But now when I'm telling stories about Brandy or the kids that I'm generally in the same room with them now. So that's, it's a little bit, so you can pray for me here, but here's the story. We're coming home from the Oregon coast and Nicole was just a little baby. We don't have cell phones. We don't have anything like that. And I'm a kind of guy that I just want to get to wherever I'm going. If it's the vacation spot, if it's home, wherever it is, let's go. Well, we didn't have much gas, but I thought, okay, so we're going to pack up. We're just going to get started, okay? We're just going to get started and go, and, and, and then once we catch a rhythm, we'll get kind of beat traffic a little bit, and then we'll, we'll get gas. Well, we start driving, and, and all of a sudden, I pass a couple of gas stations. Brandy's like, aren't you going to stop? I'm like, no, I'm not going to stop. We got plenty of gas. We didn't. We got plenty of gas. And she goes, no, I really think you... And it started an argument between us and, and, and to where, you know, I was upset that you, you let me drive. Let, I, I got this. Let me do my job. Let me drive. And she was like, why don't you... you we got a kid in the back and, and what are we going to do? Stranded? And we said, so then we keep going. And all of a sudden there's just road. There's nothing. There's no gas stations or anything. And this gas tank is going closer to E, closer to E, and until we're actually below E. The gauge actually read below E. And Brandy got so mad at me that she actually stopped talking to me. And that's the worst. I'd rather her yell at me, but the sound of silence is, that's the worst. That's the, t- the tip of anger. And we were stressed. She was mad. We were frantic. I was praying like crazy because I need some divine help here. And we finally found a gas station. And, and when I say we like fumed in, we fumed in. And I'll tell you that after we filled up, she was still upset because we, I, I put us through this thing where we didn't have to go through. And, and this ride, it didn't have to be uncomfortable. It didn't have to be so frustrating. It didn't have to be so stressful. It didn't have to have so much anxiety in this ride. But what happened is if I would have just filled up at the beginning, all of that would have been avoided. And I think that is a, parable, a parallel to our life, that there are so many things. I think a lot of the secret to a lot of our failure really is the failure in our secret prayer life. That if you look at all the, the bumps and the, the, the chaos in our life, you know, what, when, when, when we have failed in life, what's our prayer life like? We, we could fill up and just get rid of a lot of anxiety, a lot of trouble that we wouldn't have had if we would have just taken the time. Go into your room, close the door, pray to God, let him speak back to you. I'm reading this book by Francis Chan, actually, I'm rereading, it's called Letters to the Church. And he shares a a story where as a lead pastor of this church, it is required for his staff to pray at least one hour a day. It's a requirement. He actually says that if you can't pray one hour a day, I want you to come and see me so I can replace you with someone who's willing to do that. 
He says, I would much rather hire someone who prayed and did nothing else than someone who worked tirelessly without praying. What he's saying is is that prayer is the most profitable activity. That that we can do so much for God with right intention or wrong intention. We could do so much, so much, so much, but it doesn't matter if we don't have a prayer life. And Jesus is warning this. Take the time to go into the room. Shut the door. Simply be with God, because if not, what will happen is that we're going to be so busy doing stuff for God that we actually neglect being with God. And then it's just on us and in and, and our, own, our own strength. And, and, and that's, that's not what God wants. That's not what God needs. You look at the life of Jesus. Who did more for God than Jesus? Who did more for ministry than Jesus? But Jesus also had a private, personal prayer life. Look at Matthew 14, 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. Mark 1, 35. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there where he prayed. He did so much during his life, but he still took the time to go and be alone and pray. So there's an action item to this sermon, like right away, is, 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 is when and where can you most naturally create a time to be with God every single day? When would be a good time that that you can actually put in your calendar? Does that mean you might have to get up earlier? Maybe. Does it mean you might have to stay up later? Maybe. Does it mean that you have to trade uh, a a, a Netflix show or, or social media time or something just to be with God? Maybe. But when and where can you designate a place and a time to simply be with God. He wants to communicate with you. He wants, he has something for you and, and he wants to hear from you. Because it's in that secret prayer, that, that prayer where nobody else is around and you don't have to stack up or measure up and try to impress anybody. It's that secret prayer where, where you can just pour out your heart to the one who loves you. When can you do that every day? Where can you do that every day? And put it on your to-do list. Put it on your calendar. The things that are priority to you get scheduled. And finally, Jesus ends with this instruction. Again, a do not. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Do not empty, empty phrases. What is, what is that? I love the, the NIV version of that. It, it, it says, don't keep on babbling. So empty phrases, don't keep on babbling. What, what Jesus is after is, is, is principles of prayer. He wants you to learn principles of prayer. He doesn't need you to learn catchphrases and, and things that you can just think of and say without even really putting any thought or effort into it. Because a lot of times our prayers can be like that, can't they? they just, we just say the same things over and over. And that's not, there's nothing wrong with being repetitive. But, but sometimes we can say things without even really being engaged and thinking about it. They're just these prayers that we pray. And, and then afterward, we can kind of check off that box that, that we had our prayer time. It's like this. If, if, you, if you're driving, you're listening to the radio, there are some songs that you can just sing and not even think about. You just know the words, and you're driving, and you're cruising. You know the words. You're singing along, but you can still focus on the road. You can still focus on everything else. You can probably have a side conversation, go right back to the song. You just know it, but it just kind of happens. Here's the thing. One of the greatest things that's happened to me, last year in my vehicle, I have a 24-7 Elvis radio station. It's a beautiful thing. It was a gift from God, and so I love the thing. I love it. I listen to it all the time. My family, they don't. They don't love it. Two reasons why. One, they don't have very good taste in music. Honestly, they don't. Uh, 
they don't call him the king of rock and roll for nothing, but that's okay, that's another story for another time. Secondly, they don't like it because they know I'm going to sing along all the time. I get in, we're going to listen to Elvis, and they, ah, uh, why? I sing, I sing along, and I don't even have to think about it. I just know the words, and it just comes to me, and I can go wherever I'm going. I can still watch traffic, and I can even actually think about other things and still sing along because it just comes. If we're not careful, our prayer life can be the same. So don't heap up empty phrases. Don't babble. We ever, ever notice that, that sometimes our prayers can just be things that, that we just say without even thinking. And, and so what, 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 what Jesus is trying to say is, is be engaged. Be intentional. Know what you're saying. Mean what you're saying. Be there. Be there. Because if not, we can just heap up these empty phrases with no heart behind them. And no intentionality. And so Jesus says, don't do that. But mean what you say. Be present in your prayer. The main thing that God really asks for is our attention. Are we willing to give him our attention fully? In every word that we speak and, 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 and as we prepare to pray, are we going to be fully present? So when Jesus teaches here, before, he, before the pattern of prayer, when he says, you know, don't heap up empty phrases and go to your, your room and close the door and, and, and pray in secret and, and don't simply pray to be seen with others. What is he saying is, is we want to make sure your relationship with God is right first. That your relationship is right. Your mind is right. Your heart is right towards God before you do the activity of prayer. Because the truth is, we can have two types of relationship with God. We can have a family relationship with God where he is our father and we are his children. That's the relationship he desires. Or we can have a business relationship with God. And a business relationship is the one where, where we're going to pray to be seen, to get recognized from other people, where we want the platform, where we want the accolades that, that we have to do this for God because, because God needs us to do that. That's a business relationship. See, a business relationship is, is I have something for you. But a personal family relationship is not what I have for you. It's who I am to you. And that's a big difference. Business relationship is, is what I can do for you. Is, it, it's, it's about performance. And, and you know how business relationships work. It is about performance because, because as long as I'm living up to my expectation, then you're going to live up to your expectation. And sometimes we have to be, you know, have a different personality. And sometimes we have to provide this and we have to perform to make sure this other person is okay and vice versa. And as long as I keep doing what I'm supposed to do, you keep doing what you're supposed to do, then we're going to have a good relationship. It's all performance-based. But a, but a family relationship, it's not performance. It's just simply about who you are. It's not what you can do for God. It's who you are to God. One's conditional, one's unconditional. So we have a choice that we can say, God, will you come into my life and will you be my boss? And if I keep doing my part, and if I keep working and doing all these things, then you'll keep blessing me, and, and we'll just kind of have this understanding, and we'll just keep going. Or you can have a family relationship with God and say, God, come into my life, be my father. That anything that I get from you is undeserved anyway. That Jesus lived the life I should have lived. He died a death that I should have died. And because of what he did for me, God, I'm inviting you to be my father. He wants to make sure that before we go into prayer, and we're going to talk about the pattern next week, but before we, we go into prayer, before we even utter a word, when we enter the throne room, when we get into his presence, that we are coming to him not as a business partner, but as his child. I have two kids. Very different. One's a girl, 
One's a boy, very different personalities, very different interests, very different giftings. I love them both equally. And I'll tell you something about these two kids. There is nothing that they can do, nothing that they can do to make me love them more. There's nothing that they can do to earn my love. They already have it because I'm their dad. There's nothing that they can do to, 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 to earn a, a deeper love that I have for them. It's already there. Well, maybe if I clean the house or, or make dinner, or maybe if I play sports or do that, then maybe dad will love me more. That, there's no way. There's no way I can love these two kids more than I do right now. There's nothing they can do to earn that. There's nothing they can do for me to not love them. They just have that because I'm their dad, because they're my kids. They don't have to perform for me. My love is there for them unconditionally, the fullest measure that I can. What would our prayer life look like if we entered into prayer with that mindset that God loves me and I am truly his child? That there's nothing that I have to do. I don't need to perform. I don't need to showcase and I don't need to try to impress God. I don't need to try to impress other people. That I can just come in broken. I can come in messed up. I can come in happy and, and, and full of faith. I can come in how I am and God's going to love me because I'm his child. Jesus is saying that's the mindset that we need to have before we even utter a word of prayer. God's not interested in your performance. He's not interested in his show. You don't have to keep up with other people. You don't have to impress God. All you need to do is go into your room, go into that place, shut the door, and just be authentically you. Just be his child. That's all he wants, and that is enough. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for the teaching of Jesus. Thank you that we don't have to perform. Thank you that we don't have to measure up or try to earn your love. It's already there. Lord, we're thankful that that we can just enter and and, and talk to you as, as as your child, that you love us so much and that you care for us so much. And Lord, will you teach us, teach us the heart behind prayer before we even, even say a word to you? Will you, will you help us know that, that, that God, you just want us fully. We just, you just want the, the authentically us. You don't, you don't want to show. You don't want anything else. You just want who we are. So Lord, will you give us these, the desire to, to create a time and space to be with you? Lord, will you speak to us during that time? God, will we speak to you just through our heart, not just through our mind, but through our heart, God? Just lay it all out to you because you love to hear from us and you want, you're there for us. And Lord, we praise you that there is nothing that we can do to earn your love. It's already there. So Lord, will you help us continue just to learn the, the, the principles and pattern of prayer? so we can just draw closer to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.